Okay, good afternoon. Everybody hear me all right? I'm going to pace a little. Uh, I have, I've, I've been back in the university since 2004, and the professor stuff starting to wear off on me. See, I bring a big pile of kids for a short talk. Uh, can't forget this one. So, I wanted to say that I'm looking forward to this discussion, dialogue. I think that word is very important. And because we have some challenges. We, we being agriculture and everyone who eats. So I guess that means everybody, right? Um, and, and hopefully some of the things we'll accomplish in this next day or so is answer a bit more the question, where is there some consensus about some of these issues? And particularly, where is the science-based agreement or disagreement? the science-based. And then secondly, we need to think a little bit more about this next point. Where are the value-based agreements or disagreements? Hopefully some of the actions that might come out of this meeting is uh, that maybe there would be the establishment of a working committee. It would be nice if we had uh, a list of information gaps, research scientific information gaps, and then someone who wanted to write the check to, you know, do the research as well. That would be nice. And also, I think it'd be worthwhile at the end of the day if we kind of had some criterion that might be used for decision making. You know, when we walk through life, when we transported our bodies here to this meeting, there were agreed upon rules. Fortunately, the guys driving the airplanes had agreed upon rules. If you're going east-west, you're at one elevation. If you're going north-south, you're at another elevation. You always do what the man at the control tower tells you to do. You know, there's a certain set of agreed upon decision criteria, and maybe we need to have that for this particular discussion and debate. So one of the first things to think about, and this is honestly probably hard for almost everybody in this room, is to accept the fact that there are times when science cannot help us make a decision. My guess is many, most of you have some extra letters behind your name. So you come from the science perspective, and we've been taught to believe that science can virtually solve everything. Um, I'll never forget the University of Michigan for their hospitals had a big billboard right near the hospital that said, Knowledge Heals. Okay, that works for everyone who made it out of the hospital, right? <laughs> And, and, but we have this assumption. But you have to understand that there are times when science may not help us, um, when values are actually at play here. And values may play a larger role in the choices than not. And this is some criterion that comes from this book. And this is an easy and worthwhile read. It's called The Honest Broker. And it's by Roger Pielke. And he talks about how science is used in a lot of the challenging debates in society today, particularly environmental ones. But when values play a large role in the possible choice, then science may not be very helpful. He used the example of how do you respond to an oncoming tornado versus how do you deal with the question of abortion. Okay, Science can generally solve the tornado issue. Values and religion are going to probably enter in to a great deal to the, uh, to the abortion issue. If there's only a limited number of choices, do this, don't do this, then science can be very helpful. Or when there's little uncertainty about the probability of some outcomes. The challenge, and I realize this on a personal level, is what's mentioned in this quote here. I've been involved in this antibiotic discussion for since at least 2004, when I first published uh, my risk assessment on, on the risk of antibiotic use in livestock. I'm silencing my phone like how everyone else is and putting my timer on also. So the challenge is that um, science is not necessarily going to answer this question about how to use antibiotics. Um, and I thought my risk assessment was going to answer the day and a few other risk assessments would solve it all. Uh, the paper I published showed that you were more likely to die from a bee sting then you were to get a few extra days of diarrhea because of, of use of a particular antibiotic. And well, somebody in this room pointed out to me, I won't say who, 
um, after we told this story a few times, he said, you know, I don't think people are listening. So I struggled with that. Why weren't people listening to this? Objective data, 140-some references in this paper that said the risk was minimal. And I think part of the reason is because they didn't understand what I was saying. Um, and that happens often with science. But also because they didn't want to understand. Because they had some other motivating factors. Some of them may be a political. Some of them may be a religious. Um, some of them are just thinking, you now life ought not be that way. And so science may not help in that one. But what happens, and I'll quote this, and this is actually a quote from Daniel Swaretz, Swaretz, says, rather than resolving the political debate, science often becomes ammunition in partisan squabbling, mobilized selectively by contending sides to bolter, bolster their positions. Because science is highly valued as a source of reliable information, disputants look to science to help legitimate their in interests. In such cases, the scientific experts on each side of the controversy effectively cancel each other out, and the more powerful political or economic interests prevail, just as they would without science. So, important lesson. There is a large element of politics in this. And I learned this, fortunately, a long time ago when I first started doing risk assessments for USDA, and we were all excited about what risk assessment could do to answer these interesting questions. And I was working for vet services at the time. And we sent the message somehow up the chain to the secretary, so what are you going to do with our risk assessments when we're done? And he gave a very astute answer. He said, we're going to throw them into the political mix. And that's what happens. And so you're going to hear a lot of science in the few day, next day or so. And the question is, where does it enter into the political mix? And how will the sausage maker of politics grind this forward to some to potential decisions? So as an example of some of the values-based questions that I think are latent here or obvious is the question of, is modern farming acceptable? Confinement operations, they're acceptable. Is it acceptable that one man owns 80% of livestock production in your county, state, whatever? Is that acceptable? Of course, the key political question, who should benefit and how much? How much suffering to animals should be permitted or avoided? Not a scientific question. How much veterinary oversight is enough? Maybe that's a values-based question. In fact, I'm sure it is. Someone was sharing me with me a conversation they'd had with a medical doctor who could not comprehend the fact that we cannot inject every animal that needs treatment on a farm, that you have to find other ways to deliver the antibiotics. And because that person could not comprehend that, the discussion was over. The idea of mass medication was that's, that's something they do in Mars or in a foreign evil country, as part of the evil axis. Um, another question is how much is, what is overuse or what is unacceptable use? I mean, clearly the word unacceptable is a values-based word, okay? So when you start going down there, realize that your PhD ain't going to help you much, unless maybe you have a PhD in theology or something. Um, and then, of course, the bottom line question I think that's really here is, what is acceptable risk? We're not going to say that there is no risk because of for antibiotic use in on farms. But the question is, what is acceptable? We're probably going to say the risk is very low. So my points in my little session is just to remind you of a few principles of risk assessment. First, that concern or the identification of a hazard is not equivalent to risk. We'll talk about that in a bit. Risk requires a causal or a connected causal pathway with a case-by-case -case analysis. Talk about that. And then the alternative risk of suboptimal animal health may actually be higher than the risk of on-farm antibiotic use. And I'll try to explain that point. Okay, first one. 
Antimicrobial resistant bacteria. They sound nasty. They are. They are a hazard. They're found in many places. They're on farms, conventional farms, and on organic farms. They're found in the groundwater, deep ocean trenches. They're found in uh, Arctic and subarctic seals. Find antimicrobial resistant bacteria. I'm sure they're on growth promoters. Wild boars, baboons, a new paper I just saw, 30-year-old permafrost, and they swear no current livestock or animals or anything has come in contact with that permafrost based on other genetic testing, but they find antimicrobial resistant bacteria there. Quote, they're found in places which are relatively untouched by human civilization. They're a hazard. They're out there. They've been out there, as you know, since the beginning of bacteria. Reminder that hazard does not mean risk. Water can be a hazard. What makes it a hazard? The dose. Okay, if that's me surfing, there is risk. Okay? So water has just become, in combination with dose, it has become a risk. Lots of hazards under your kitchen counter, or your sink. What makes them a risk? Exposure. Here's one, a hazardous material that causes cramps, nausea, dizziness, respiratory difficulties, convulsions capable of leading to death. Everybody know what this hazard is? Oxygen. What is it, about 20% of this room has it in it? This is right off the hazardous material data safety sheet. Nasty stuff. Okay. What makes it a risk or what makes it cause harm? Too much of it. Too little of it's not good on the left side of the graph. Too much of it on the right is not good. So what's the lesson? Poison's in the dose. Okay. Risk is about two things. Probability and consequence. Or exposure and dose. You can't have risk without both of those. So just a reminder of a few concerns from the Infectious Disease Society of America. MRSA, okay, mostly a nosocomial hospital problem. CDC said it's not a foodborne infection. Or, um, this one I can hardly say the name of, but it's one on their top list. It's mostly a problem in soldiers apparently returning from Iraq. Bad bug, not something to do with farms. Vancomycin resistance, again, a hospital nosocomial. You all know what nosocomial is, right? It occurs in the hospital. Uh, at least it's not idiopathic. You know what idiopathic is, right? Caused by an idiot. Okay, the interesting thing is that we have VRE in this country. We've never used vancomycin resistant or vancomycin type drugs in livestock in this country. Pseudomonas. Okay, the interesting thing is this top list from this infection. Society of America, very few have anything to do with agriculture. Okay? We're thinking about my next point, which is connecting the causal pathway. Hazard creates concern. I appreciate what FDA says and will talk to us about today is the concerns that they have. Concern is not risk. Nuclear regulatory folks figured this out a long time ago, and they said, you know, we're going to have to do some risk assessment here. Because people are really worried about nuclear energy. Let's estimate what the real risks are. Okay? All right, so a risk assessment does this. Estimates the probability that resistant bacteria are present in the target animal as a result of drug use. If it's there because you had some Arctic seals on your farm, that's not a problem. Okay? It's because of drug use. And... Humans ingest that bacteria in question from the relevant food commodity. Okay, This is all from FDA's Guidance 152 on how they'd like to see their risk assessments done. And human exposure to the resistant bacteria results in adverse health consequence. In other words, something bad happens. Somebody's got to get sick or sicker or be sick longer or turn green or something because of the use of uh, because they've received the resistant bacteria. 
So, first question in statistics. When you see three ands, what does that do to you statistically, or what does that mean? Right. It's a conditional probability. If any one of those go away, the risk goes to zero. Not just to, to nil, but to zero. So if you stop the dominoes anywhere, the risk goes away. Okay. Or if you make any of those really teeny, the risk goes away. I'm sorry, it doesn't go away. The risk gets really teeny. Because conditional probabilities, you multiply them all together. And they're the conditional on each other. And this shows the pathway that's um, pulled, that you can read in uh, Guidance 152. And I'll show it to you. Oh, just a side point here. When we talk about doing this, we have to address it on for each bacteria, each drug combination. Because FDA is going to ask, is drug X being used on the farm? And when and how and that sort of thing. And then the, sick, the doctor at the other end is going to say, my patient is sick with bug Y. Okay? Is that because of antibiotic use X on the farm? So it has to be answered specifically for each combination because every bug is different, every antibiotic is different. Here's the causal pathway spelled out a little more specifically going from the bottom left to the top right. Each is a conditional probability. First, the animals have to be treated. Easy to see. If we don't treat them, it goes away. Then the resistant determinant, that's what we call RZD. So it may be a piece of genome, and these guys are promiscuous. They share genomes. They even share genomes across species. Um, so this determinant uh, ha occurs, and then it leaves the farm. Somehow, most likely route for it to leave the farm is in the animal. Is it going to get in the meat? Because that's the foodborne route that FDA has told us to focus on. Does the person get infected and actually sick? If you have a resistant bacteria in your gut, most likely every person in this room has some sort of resistant bacteria. We give you some antibiotics. In a few days, we can culture resistant bacteria out of you. There are always some floating around in there. Uh, but the question is then, does it go on to cause harm? Does the person get sick? Do they go to the doctor and fail to get better because of that resistance? That's an important question. Do they fail to get better? Is there harm? Because as we said, risk has to have two things, probability and consequence. Now, another pathway you'll notice is on the uh, the bottom. One of these is supposed to be a pointer. but On the bottom, and this is the environmental route. This is the possibility, and a lot of people talk about it. When they make the statement, contributing to the gene pool of resistant bacteria, so I, think, I think they're in referring to this pathway where the bacteria um, get off the farm, you know, and the manure. It's uh, the, getting the fields out of the crop where I live in Iowa, and all the manure is going in, and it, it just smells good, you know. So you wonder about those uh, resistant bacteria finding their way somehow to the human. All right. So I do try to get my kids to wear shoes and wash their feet, at least this, or wear, wear shoes and wash their hands at least during this time of year, because again we've got to get that resistant determinant in there. But you know where I live on a mile section, there's only three families. Okay, so there's not a lot of exposure. Um, but this is a pathway that has to be considered, and again, go on down to whether or not there's harm. This one I think I'll skip because I've talked about it just briefly. This is a table showing published quantitative risk assessments, asking the question, what is the harm? And all of these papers, except the first one by FDA on enrofloxacin, show very low risk. Okay, one in 80 million, one in 10 million. This is the bee sting one I mentioned, streptogramin. So these are some of the more common antibiotics used in livestock. And the risk estimates seem to be very low. Okay, I'm running out of time. So I won't spend too much on this one. Um, <clears throat> I haven't shown you the risk to be zero. The question is, why should we take some additional risk? Part of it becomes value-based questions at this point in time. But another thing I need you to consider is that the potential of alternative risks might be higher. And I say consider because this is an area where I'm convinced more research data are needed. 
And that's the question of whether or not there's a relationship between animal health and human illness dates. Here's a paper we did, and I'm sure you would love to learn all about the ordinary differential equations that we used to model this relationship. But because my timer dinged, I'm going to skip all that and simply show you that as potency ratio is the rate thing on the bottom, illness days are these variables. And essentially what this model showed as the relationship between sick animals and carcass contamination increased, then the number of illness days in humans increased. Which means something that we've learned back since 1906 in the Food Safety Act, healthy animals must enter the food chain. Even marginally ill animals need to enter the food chain. Okay? So, quickly show you the data, a couple studies that I've done in pigs to ask that question about that D potency factor. What we found is peel outs go up. Peel outs are when, um, I'll show you a picture one in a minute. Um, these are lesions, chronic respiratory lesions in pigs. Okay, pigs look great, pass anti-mortem inspection. As that percentage goes up, so does carcass contamination with Campylobacter. Okay, carcass contamination with Campylobacter most likely converts into illness days, human illness days. Same thing, another paper that's coming out in the Journal of Vet Research where we did a more uh, detailed, careful study looking at carcasses with peel-outs and carcasses without. And we found that carcasses with peel-outs, I'll just show you the picture. The carcass on the left is a grade 6. Three pathologists scored these, had peel-out, okay? They remove all that material, but this carcass on the left is 90% more likely to be contaminated with salmonella than the healthy carcass on the right. So, when I say healthy animals make safe food, I'm not just giving you a company jingle, okay? But that's only two studies, two and a half studies. We did the, the Singer one was in poultry. I think this is an important point because no matter what we do to the livestock, whether we remove the antibiotics, whether we change the antibiotics, whether in the name of sustainability we do a number of other management changes, if we decrease animal health, there will be public health consequences. So I think that's an important take home and I would offer as one where much more research data are needed. So in summary, I think I've said these points. Concern is not the same as risk. The estimated risk is extremely low. The alternative risk may be much higher. So as we move forward in this discussion, let me offer these suggestions. And I'll, I'll get on our speakers this afternoon. I'll ask questions, and I hope all of you will ask lots of questions. Think about this. Something that a point that a speaker makes, or a point that an, a questioner makes, is that a value-based point, or is it a science-based point? If it's a value-based point, then we won't be able to answer it with publications. We'll have to answer it in some other way. Where does this fact, this factoid, this piece of data that, this next, that someone presents, where does it fit into the causal pathway, going from concern to actual risk? Important questions. Next, another one that's real important is what's the level of uncertainty about this fact? I've shared with you that point, that last point that I make is still fairly, fairly uncertain. There's just a couple papers on it right now. What's the level of uncertainty? Are we really, really sure that this is a relationship between these two factors? And another one that we have to think about a lot more is what are the potential secondary or unintended consequences of an action? If we take an action then what other things do we have to do? A great example is airbags, okay? All cars have airbags in them now. But now you can't put your kid in the car seat in the front, right? Any kid under X number of pounds can't sit in the front seat. That was not intended. They didn't know that was going to happen, okay? Now my kids can't ride shotgun, okay? So <laughs> there was another great one I just read about in that book. In, in, in Mexico City, in order to reduce pollution, they... Um, they said, okay, people with odd license plates can drive on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. People with evens can drive on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. They implemented this thing, thought it would reduce air pollution. Air pollution increased dramatically. I know why. Everybody went out and bought a second car. So they had odd and even license plates, so there's more cars on the road. And usually the ones they bought were old clunkers that belched more fuel.
So, unintended consequences. We have to always think about those. 